Hello, um, back on December 29th, I delivered a sermon in church called Answering Questions and Questioning Answers, and I was very excited to deliver this sermon, and I was so excited that I forgot to record it back on December 29th, and um, because there was some folks asking for it, I've decided to kind of re-record that sermon in a more conversational way in my church office. So every couple of years, I do an exercise in church that is called the question box sermon. The idea is this, that for a period of several weeks, I set out slips of paper in which I invite uh, people to ask questions, and they ask their questions, and then they put them in the good old question box, and then I uh, preach a sermon in which I try to respond to as many questions as I can in about uh, 20 minutes. I like this exercise. It's a break from the routine. It offers a random glimpse into the types of things that are on the minds of some of our church community. And I always look as well for patterns. Are the same sorts of questions coming up again and again? And this year, I'm particularly grateful for our coming of age class uh, and Dana Lundquist, who made it an exercise at one of their December coming of age meetings to uh, fill the question box with lots of great questions. And so we're gonna go uh, through a whole bunch of these questions this morning. A large number of questions that were asked this year were of the get to know you variety. Were you always a Unitarian Universalist? One person asked. What made you join Unitarian Universalism? Asked another. I've been a UU for essentially my whole life. My parents joined a Unitarian Universalist church in my hometown of Wayland, Massachusetts, which is about 20 miles west of Boston, uh, when I was still an infant. So my experience with religious education in my childhood was rather similar to the experiences that our children and youth have. I went to religious education classes. I experienced many of the same or similar programs that our children experience today. I experienced neighboring faiths, though it was called something different when I did it. And I experienced our whole lives, OWL, though it was called something different when I did it. I experienced coming of age, which was called coming of age when I did it. And um, I experienced youth group, which when I did it was called Why Are You You? Why are you you? Young religious Unitarian Universalists. Interestingly, the most frequent question asked this year, asked in five different ways, had to do with vocation. One, how long have you known you wanted to be a pastor? Two, what led you to being a minister? Three, if you were not a minister, what would you be? Four, if you weren't a minister, what would you be? That one had an apostrophe in it. And five, will you ever pick a new job? I choose not to read anything sinister into that last question, by the way. I actually decided that I wanted to be a minister when I was around 15 or 16 years old. And what made me interested in this path was a couple of different things. First, I really liked church a lot, and that tends to help when you want to become a minister. I also had a tremendous amount of respect for the ministers in my congregation. But more than that, there was this sense that what the church was doing was really important and it made a difference in my life. And I was sincerely grateful for that and wanted to spend my life creating that type of community that had been so important to me. By the time I turned 17, I had pretty much figured out my path. In my college admission essay, written when I was 17, I said, quote, My plan is to major in religion, then go to divinity school at Harvard, then become a Unitarian Universalist parish minister. That was an actual line from my application essay to college, and um, that's pretty much what happened. Maybe I'm stubborn. Somehow this is year number 17 in the ministry for me, and I still enjoy it. One person asked, what would I do if I didn't do this? Before I was 15, before I understood that ministry is a profession that you can choose, you can study to become, you can prepare for, I was pretty sure that I wanted to be a psychologist. And over the last two decades, not often, but from time to time, I've imagined myself doing different jobs, including teacher, professor, therapist, librarian, human resources manager, that one surprised me, and 
probably a few more in there as well. But I don't have any plans not to do ministry. Someone asked me, and uh, this was interesting, someone asked me, where do you get your ties? I'm not sure, this is the fun thing with questions, is that sometimes you're not sure how to read them. Is it, is it, where do you get your ties? Or is it, where do you get your ties? So not knowing, I would normally uh, kind of just ignore a question like that, except, except that during the fall a few months ago, the Committee on Ministry did an annual evaluation, and this year what they did for me was they interviewed 18 different le church leaders. And one leader in the church told them, the most critical thing I can say about our minister is that my wife doesn't like his ties. And um, I actually don't have a large selection of ties. The last time I bought a tie was when I was applying for this ministry position. And um, I will just say, I have no idea where I bought it. It was about you know seven years ago. And if anybody wants to offer a men's fashion tutorial at the next year's fall auction, I would probably bid on it. I want to get into some deeper questions. And yes, there were deeper questions this year. One person wrote, do you believe in an afterlife? It's an interesting question because earlier in my ministry, back when I did a question box sermon at my last church, I actually got this same question and I said, probably, probably not. There's nothing that leads me to believe in an afterlife. But this year, our, um, in kind of where my journey has taken me, I would answer it a little bit differently now. And I'm going to answer this question in a little bit of a roundabout way. I want to tell you about a man named Jim Tucker. Jim did his undergraduate degree here at UNC, studying psychology at UNC Chapel Hill, graduating with honors. He went on to graduate from medical school here at UNC. And from there, he went on to the University of Virginia. Would we agree that then we would all agree that the University of Virginia is a pretty fine academic institution. At, uh, at the University of Virginia, at UVA, he became head of children's psychiatry, as well as a tenured professor with a prestigious named professorship. He's a world-renowned medical doctor. He is also, his field of research is the past lives of children. He studies children who claim to remember having a past life, who claim to remember living as someone else before they were reincarnated as who they are. At UVA, he continues and he advances the work of Ian Stevenson, who pioneered this field of research. For 50 years, for five decades, UVA's psychology and psychiatry departments have had a division dedicating to studying these sorts of phenomena. At UVA, you'll also find a professor named Bruce Grayson. And Dr. Grayson's area of research is near-death experiences, the experience of people who very nearly die, who claim to have some experience of an afterlife, but who do not die and are trying to make a sense of this experience. And it's not just UVA where researchers are studying these people with stories to tell about near-death experiences and um, reincarnation. There's a division dedicated to similar sorts of research at Rice University in Houston. There's a division dedicated to related fields of research at Duke University, a school that I'm, few, I'm sure a few of us at UNC have heard about. And I kind of take seriously the academic work of Jim Tucker and Ian Stevenson and Bruce Grayson and, and, and. And a decade ago, I would have answered this differently, but my, my answer now is different. Do I believe in the afterlife? Belief is not the right word for me. What I would say is that I am open-minded to scholars who consider the realm of the afterlife, and I'm open-minded to people who have claimed some sort of experience of something we might call an afterlife. I find it interesting that my thinking on this matter has changed not because my beliefs have mapped on to the Christian, the notion of a Christian heaven, or a Norse Valhalla, or a Hindu notion of samsara leading towards nirvana. No, my thinking has actually changed due to humanistic scholars, including psychologists, social scientists, philosophers, 
and probably some physicists who I don't understand who are kind of talking and thinking through uh, this sort of thing. So um, yes, I am, uh, I am open-minded to the idea of an afterlife. I want to switch gears. Um, every year I get a few heavy questions. Um, this year one person asked, how do you get over going no contact with abusive or borderline personality disorder adult family members? How do you get over going no contact when it's best for you, but you still love them? To the person who asked this question, let me first say it's such a hard, hard situation to be in. And let me also say that you are in no way alone in having to navigate these sorts of challenges. There are many, many people I've met in ministry who have struggled deeply with coming to a place with loving a family member and deciding that what is best for them is no longer having contact with that family member. So you're not alone. So what I'd like to offer you is a way of possibly thinking about this situation. As Unitarian Universalists, our first principle is that everyone has inherent worth and dignity. Every person has inherent worth and dignity. Every person, but not every action, not every behavior, not every thought, and not every belief. As human beings, we can behave in all sorts of ways that are actually below, below our worth and dignity. And sometimes when someone has a track record of behaving in ways that is below their worth and dignity, sometimes the most loving thing to do is to not allow that person to treat you that way. It's a hard decision to reach, but sometimes it's a uh, decision that makes sense. You can love someone so much that you won't allow them to treat you in ways that are harmful to you and harmful to their own worth and dignity. With abuse, you can love yourself enough that you won't let yourself be abused, but I believe it's also possible to love the other person enough to not give them the opportunity to abuse you, because when they do that, they are acting beneath who they are as a person. Switching gears, Marion Hirsch and her coming-of-age mentee, Avis Lavender, asked a number of questions, and since Marion gave me a hard time about not answering her question the last two times I did question box sermon here, I thought I would try to answer her. Marion asked the question, are you patriotic? Why or why not? And I want to answer this question with um, a couple of stories, and they deal not with the United States, but with another country. A decade ago, I took a sabbatical and went and lived in Ecuador for several months. One day I was taking the bus around the capital city of Quito, and we came to this large bus stop, Parada Jefferson Perez, and there was a little green space outside of this bus stop with a statue of Jefferson Perez. Jefferson Perez is an Olympic athlete who won two Olympic gold medals, a goal, or two Olympic medals, a gold and a silver, and he is the only athlete from Ecuador ever to win an Olympic medal, and he won his medals in the sport of race walking, speed walking, which, uh, no offense to race walking, but it is far from the most prestigious Olympic sport. And I'll tell you that around Quito, I ran into, in, in Quito, probably three or four statues of Jefferson Perez. This is how much he was celebrated, and it seems like sort of celebrating uh, this person who won a medal for your country is kind of a healthy kind of patriotism and enthusiasm um, is, is, just, is just great and positive, and um, I, I really liked that. However, later in my sabbatical in Ecuador, I was reminded of the bad side of patriotism, the bad side of this sense of love of nation. When I was in Ecuador, there was a major soccer tournament happening in South America. Teams were playing to qualify for the World Cup. 
And when the Ecuadorian national team plays, the entire country stops and watches. Stores shut, uh, museums stop offering tours, restaurants close, everything shuts down and everyone gets in front of a television to watch the Ecuadorian uh, men's soccer team play. So I'm watching Ecuador play this game. It's a game that they must win to have any chance of qualifying for the World Cup. I'm with this large group of people and the game is not going well for Ecuador. And next to me, I'm listening in on the conversation for the soccer fans that are sitting next to me watching. I used to know Spanish well enough to eavesdrop in Spanish. And the people next to me, when the team was losing, began talking about how the problem with Ecuador's soccer team was that there were too many dark-skinned players. There was some kind of nasty colorism, some nasty racism framed as patriotism, that, that they were saying that, that not only were dark-skinned players deficient, but that they, couldn't, they didn't have the same pride of country. This amazingly racist thing. They were advancing the theory that light-skinned soccer players were better for all of these racist reasons. And patriotism often looks like that as well. The word patriot comes from the Greek patrioikos, or countryman, but it often, it also likely goes back even further to the term father, pater, patros. And I would just mention that the Bible contains competing claims about fathers, and we might say that patriotism is loving your father land. There is in the Torah the essential commandment to honor thy father and mother. But there's also Jesus' commandment, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother cannot be my disciple. And I read this as a tension between the particular and the universal. And when it comes to patriotism, I tend more towards the universal side. I tend to be interested in the universalities of human beings, the universalities of the earth, of ecos ecosystems. I'm interested in all of these things more than I'm interested in the lines, the arbitrary lines of nations and borders. And so to the question, I tend to be much more of a universalist in that sense than I tend to be a... Um, a specific patriot. A couple of quick questions and answers. Uh, someone asked, name five books by women that have influenced you. Now my favorite author is Marilyn Robinson. The novel Gilead um, is probably my favorite novel and her essay collection, When I Was a Child I Read Books, um, is probably my favorite nonfiction book. So we have a two out of the five. My favorite poet is Jane Hirschfield, and so I'm going to put on that list her uh, poetry collection called After. I love American history, and probably the most fun and accessible book about colonial New England is Sarah Vowell's The Wordy Shipmates. And um, this deals with the history of kind of early congregationalism in America, and those early congregationalists were some of the people who became, or who would grow into Unitarians. So if you want, an amazing intellectual history that partially sort of explains the origins of Unitarianism. That's a great book, Sarah Vowell's The Wordy Shipmates. That's four. And, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to pick one more. So I'm really interested in the writing of Adrienne Marie Brown about social change. So her books, um, Pleasure Activism and Emergent Strategy, or Daring Greatly by Brene Brown, or the writings of social justice by Michelle Alexander, or Carol Anderson, or Anne Lamott, or Annie Dillard, or Mary Oliver, or Maggie Nelson, or Claudia Rankine, or the theology of Rebecca Parker, or the sermons of Victoria Safford, or the poetic meditations of Nancy Schaefer. That's such a hard question. I can't pick just five. Someone asked, what principle do you think is most important in Unitarian Universalism? And lately I've found myself most drawn to the third principle, which is the acceptance of one another and the encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. Acceptance of, acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. 
And I love the tension there. Can you hear that tension? I sometimes joke that this principle should be called the I love you just the way you are, but please change principle. And I've actually preached on this tension a couple of times. Here in this church, we want you to be accepted as you are, but we want you to also grow and change. And I find that tension to be um, just juicy and, and interesting. There were two questions from our coming of age youth. One person asked, what was your greatest challenge as a teenager? And one person asked if there was one message, perhaps something you wish yourself, you yourself had known from younger members of your congregation. If you had one message that you wanted to give to younger members of the congregation, what is it? And I think what I really want young people to develop within themselves is an extraordinary and fierce love of self. The poet Ntozake Shange, in her poem, A Laying On of Hands, writes, I found God within myself and I loved her. I loved her fiercely. The poet Kendrick Lamar sings, raps, I love myself. And I also want young people to know that they will find their people. First of all, I want them to, to have this fierce self-love, this, this fierce and powerful self-love, but I also want them to know that they will find their people. Some people find their people in high school, some people find their people in youth group, some people find their people later on in life. But when you find your people, you will know that they are your people because they love you for the same reasons that you love yourself. You will know that they are your people because they love you for the same reasons that you love yourself. One last question. Um, someone asked, where do you see our church in 20 years? In 20 years, 2040. In 20 years, I'm gonna be 62 years old. And so let me answer this question in a way that shows kind of how I think about church. And I do spend a lot of time thinking about church. When we imagine the future, we often imagine big changes and big disruptions. There are some people out there right now who predict that the religious landscape in America is going to change so dramatically in the next 20 years. Some even predict that organized religion will be will be on its way or even extinct or on its way to extinction in 20 years. And often those predictions are met with um, people recommending that we do all of these big disruptive things now to ensure survival. And it is true that there are uh, tough times right now. Um, there's a lot of denominations that are shrinking. Unitarian Universalism is really not, not one of them, although we're certainly not growing as a religious movement. Um, we're also, as a movement right now, in sort of a, a difficult time. Um, there's a lot of conflict in churches. Um, someone from the, uh, our region, the southern region, uh, said this past fall that in any given year, there are about five churches in our region that are experiencing really destructive and uh, challenging, just destructive conflict. Five churches in an average year. This past year, um, said this representative of our southern region, this past year there were 17 UU congregations in our region experiencing just catac cataclysmic conflict. Fortunately, we're not one of them. We are a healthy, healthy congregation, and we're often looked to as one of the best examples of a church that really has it going on and is doing things the right way, and I'm very, very, very proud of our church for that. So a lot of people are saying that, that there's, there's conflict and, and religion is being existentially threatened, and so we need to do all of these disruptive things, but I think about it a little bit differently. In 20 years, we are still going to need a lot of the things that we do right now. In 20 years, we're going to need to care for the spiritual growth of children. Children will still need our whole lives, though we may not always call it that. They'll still need coming of age and youth group, though we may not always call it that either. We'll still need communities where people take care of each other. Uh, visit each other in the hospital, call on each other when they're going through tough times in life. We'll still 
be a community, we'll still have need of a community where people can come together to have fun together. And so we'll still need things like the church auction and like the uh, Yule Ball, which was uh, just a few days ago. And I hope I'm wrong, I hope I'm wrong, but in 20 years there will probably still be people who need food and shelter in our community. I hope I'm wrong. And there will still be injustices that need to be challenged. I hope I'm wrong, but I think there will still be. And so we'll still need to be as a church involved in that, in taking care of our wider community and working to challenge injustice. And in 20 years, we will not have all the answers. In 20 years, we're not gonna have all the answers, so we'll probably still have question box sermons from time to time. As long as we're still answering questions and questioning answers, as long as we're still providing meaningful experiences for our children and youth, as long as we're still taking care of one another and reaching out beyond ourselves to the wider world, as long as we are singing together and making art together and eating together, as long as we are still doing that, we'll be doing what we are supposed to be doing. So amen, blessed be, and thank you.